Thank you, Jen. I appreciate uh, the opportunity to be here today. And I am thrilled um, that we have this speaker on our program today. So I'm going to do a short intro, uh, about three minutes or so, on Robert Blameyer and his book, Making a Difference. Oy, there we go. <laughs> uh, and um, so let's start with his bio. Robert Blameyer has been an active participant in politics all of his adult life. He was born in a small town in Hammond, Indiana, and his career began at the age of 18 upon entering George Washington University here in DC. His employment with Senator Birch Bayh, Democrat for Indiana, began in 1967 during Bob's freshman year and concluded with Birch Bayh's unsuccessful re-election campaign in 1980 against Dan Quayle. I can't believe he lost. Anyways, those 13 years saw Bob Lehmeyer rise from a young volunteer worker to office manager, to executive assistant in the Senate, and finally executive assistant in the Senate office. His campaign experience with Bai began by traveling with the candidate throughout the 1974 reelection campaign and continued with a variety of responsibilities in the 1976 presidential campaign and finally as political director of the 1980 presidential campaign. Also during this period, Bob completed his BA in political science and his MA in legislative affairs at George Washington University. So he was a very busy person. After the 1980 defeat, he founded a political action committee, the Committee for American Principles, an organization seeking to combat the growing role and influence of the new right in political campaigns. Now he began his next career providing political computer services in 1982. It was not yet a business in politics as we know it now. Um, however, in 1991, Bob created Blameyer Communications, a political computer services firm serving democratic campaigns, progressive organizations and political consultants. In late 2007, Blameyer Communications was acquired by Catalyst with Bob as their director until leaving at the end of 2016 to pursue other consulting and writing opportunities. One of those was last year where he became a fellow at the University of Kansas for the Dole Bai Institute. Um, so on a final note, Bob um, is moving to Chevy Chase uh, from Rockville next week. So he'll be one of us. And he has two sons, two daughters-in-laws and two grandchildren. So we're excited to welcome Bob Blameyer today to speak about his book, Birch by Making a Difference. Thank you. Thank you to my dear and close friend, Kathleen. And and Chevy Chase at home, I'm delighted to be here. You know, I, I hear all this description of my past. It just reminds me how old I am. Uh, <laughs> let me just say that, you know, let me tell you a little bit about my history with Birch Bayh, why I decided that this was a book worth pursuing, and uh, uh, as much about his record as you're willing to tolerate. Um, as Kathleen had said, I, I came to George Washington University from Indiana when I was a freshman in college. And the first day after my parents left me off at GW, I took a bus down to, to Capitol Hill to offer my 18 years of life experience to the junior senator from Indiana. And the main reason I was interested in Birch Bay, it's kind of humorous to me anyway, is that I was a big Kennedy fan, like many people of my generation were. And Birch Bay had been in the plane crash with Ted Kennedy when Kennedy broke his back in 1964. And I thought, always thought that was cool that our state senator had been in the plane crash with Kennedy, pulled him out, and was always given credit by, by Ted Kennedy for saving his life. And I thought that was pretty cool. So I, I 
went down there and was able to meet him that first day. And I guess the best way to describe it is once I got my foot in the door, I never left. So I spent, I spent 13 years working for him and, you know, went from volunteering and spending every time I could leaving campus to go back down to the hill to, to volunteer. And I, I mean, some of the things I did that were smart, I didn't even know at the time, I look in retrospect, they were smart, was that I started doing the things that the staffers hated doing. So I, I was the volunteer they wanted to have around because I did all those, those chores that they didn't like. And eventually I started to learn my way around, got on the payroll. Uh, by the time I was 22, uh, I was his office manager. And then when I was 25, we traveled together in the 1974 campaign when he beat Richard Luger, who would later come and join us in the Senate. Um, in 74, we traveled together for 153 days with three days off. We traveled 90,000 miles without leaving the state of Indiana. And it, I guess I, the best way to describe that is that it's a bonding experience that is awfully hard to duplicate. I always said to him over the years, this was, this was a, an experience I would never trade and I would never repeat. It was so incredibly exhausting. And then for the next six years, rose up in the office and became the head of what we called our Indiana department, the political department, running the Indiana operation, the staff, the field people, and then ultimately his politics. And then the 1980 campaign, which you may remember was a year when uh, Ronald Reagan beat Jimmy Carter and 12 Democratic senators lost. And the Democrats lost the majority in the Senate for the first time in something like 25, 28 years. Um, and then I had to go out and get a real job. But my relationship with Birch continued. Uh, it, it ended up when he died in, in 2019, uh, a 52-year relationship. That is, uh, I would count him among, you know, the, the adult who is more important in my life than anyone outside my parents. Um, and about 15 years ago, his uh, wife, he and his wife were over at dinner at our house. I was then married and, and his wife talked to my then wife, asking her whether I'd ever considered writing his biography. And she, what she said to me after they left. And, you know, I thought about it and I'd never written a book. So that's, this is not a minor consideration. And I called my brother-in-law who had written a number of books and I then had my own company. I was running my own company. And he said to me, there's no way you can run your company and write a biography at the same time. I mean, that's, you know, that a biography requires a lot of work <laughs> and you have to be accurate. Um, so I called the senator and said that, you know, I thought about this and I decided I couldn't do it. And he said to me at the time, he says, oh, no, no, I don't want you to do it. I'm going to do it. I'm going to write my own story. And I said to him, you know, I don't think you are. I mean, we'd already been out of office more than 20 years at this point. And he says, oh, I have software. People tell me I can get this software. I could talk into the computer. And, you know, and when we left office, everybody submitted their memories and writing. So he, had, he accumulated those. And we considered it, we continued to talk about it a little bit. And I introduced him to other authors. And one day we were out somewhere and I suggested to him that one of the best things I'd ever done in my life was I had interviewed my parents on videotape over a period of seven years. I have seven hours of cumulative videotape interviews with my parents, and then my father has since died, making them priceless. And I suggested, how about if I do that with you? And he thought about it a while, and he says, you know, I'd be willing to do that. So we, we launched on this process, began in 2012. Over the next two and a half years, I did 15 sessions of interviews with him. I have 30 hours of video interviews with him, and another 30 hours video interviews with other political figures, former staff, friends, and so on. And in the middle of that process, I got a contract from Indiana University Press to write the book. The question, one of the questions that came up early in this process when I was first thinking about it was somebody asked me a question, which, you know, I, I had to think about. He said, why would you write a book about Birch Bay? No one knows who Birch Bay is. And I thought about it and said, you know, thought, you know, we don't know 
who senators are. We People forget who senators were unless they became the nominees of one of the parties for president. And yet history is not just made up of the stories of kings and emperors and presidents. It's all the component parts that make up history. And the more I thought about it, the more I felt that Birch's part was worth a story worth telling. And it's something I know that the staff people have always, we, we all have a, a sense of joined pride about that. But at the same time, I had to ask myself, what was there about the record that was worth telling? So let me start with, with, with some, some of the facts about his record. In our history, there have been 11,000 attempts to amend the Constitution. And since the Bill of Rights, there have only been 17 successful. He has two of them. And nobody outside the Founding Fathers has more than one. So that alone puts him in the Hall of Fame of legislators. It's a pretty, uh, a pretty uh, outstanding record just in, in the area of the two constitutional amendments. And what, 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 how those came about was in his first year in the Senate, 1963, he was elected in 62 at the age of 34. He had been Speaker of the House in Indiana Speaker of the State House at age 30, a singularly impressive fact in and of itself. But at age 34, he became a senator. His first year, 1963, uh, in his first days in Washington, he and his wife were taken house hunting by Vice President Johnson, a relationship that remained close throughout the remainder of former President Johnson's life. But at the death of Senator Estes Kefauver of Tennessee in 1963, he, he, Kefauver had been the chairman of the Senate Subcommittee on Constitutional Amendments, and the subcommittee had been fairly dormant. And after Kefauver died, Bai became aware that Senator James Eastland, who was the chairman of the Senate Judiciary Committee, was going to close down the subcommittee. And he was knew that he was the only member of the Judiciary Committee, the only Democratic member who didn't have his own subcommittee. So he went to Eastland to ask him whether or not he could become the chairman of the Subcommittee on Constitutional Amendments. And it's kind of a humorous story that when he went to have a meeting with Eastland after work, it, those who know Birch know he wasn't much of a drinker. And Eastland, Southern Democrat that he was, was a good heavy drinker. And Birch was uh, applied with, with Chevis Regal all evening while they talked about the prospects of him becoming chairman of the Senate Subcommittee on Constitutional Amendments. When he came back that night, uh, his administrative assistant, Bob Keefe, was in the office and he said it was the only time before or since that he'd ever seen Birch drunk. He walks in the office and Keefe says, did you get the subcommittee? He says, nope. And the next morning, Eastland calls him and said, Birch, I think you'd make a splendid chairman of the Subcommittee on Constitutional Amendments. And that phone call changed his life. And it is typical and a good example of the way the Senate operated in that era. Very, very heavily involved in uh, personal relationships. And those relationships manifested themselves in a lot of different ways, both Democrats and Republicans, conservative Southerners and liberal Northerners. It didn't really matter. You, you worked with your colleagues and you honored them as colleagues. But how this changed Birch's life and our history is really sort of amazing because what happened shortly after he became chairman of the Subcommittee on Constitutional Amendments, President Kennedy was assassinated. And the questions immediately came up, what if the president's body had stayed technically alive while he was virtually brain dead and un unable to function as president. There was nothing in the Constitution that gave that power to the vice president except for his death. And so it seemed like there was a real need there to fill that gap in our constitutional history to make sure that there could be an, a, a smooth transfer of power to the vice president in the case of presidential inability. And so essentially, the 25th Amendment was written by, was the author of the 25th Amendment, which dealt with presidential disability and succession. And, you know, years later, his second constitutional amendment in 1972 was the 26th Amendment, which lowered the voting age to 18. So his, his history of writing those two constitutional amendments 
sort of, as I said earlier, puts him pretty much in the Hall of Fame of legislators. While he was working on one of the amendments, uh, there were a lot of women protesting in the back of the hearing room. And he asked one of the staff, he, he said, part of me wanted to just tell them, you know, just send the police and have them ushered out. But he sent a staff guy back there to ask him what the ruckus was about and told the staff person to tell them that if they were willing to settle down, he'd be happy to meet with them privately after the hearing was over, which he did. And what they were protesting about was the need for an equal rights amendment so women under the law could be treated like men. And things like we all know to, to this day, you know, equal pay for equal work and all the various slogans that are associated with the Equal Rights Amendment. And so Birch ended up introducing the Equal Rights Amendment to the Constitution and championed that all the way up until he, was, uh, he, he lost his seat in the Senate in 1980. The Equal Rights Amendment passed both houses of Congress, went to the states to be ratified. In 1977, Indiana was, in fact, the last state to ratify. And we've, the country was still three states short, which never happened before it ran out of time. So what happened in 1972, while the Equal Rights Amendment was having some difficulties, was the Educational Opportunity Act of 1972 was up for renewal. Birch stuck in into a section called Title IX, a restriction that any college or university that accepts federal money cannot treat men and women differently. Title IX became the single greatest accomplishment in his career in terms of the way he was honored through the remainder of his life. And the impact it had on the country was enormous. I mean, with the time Title IX, just as an example, at the time Title IX was passed, there were 250,000, about a quarter million women or girls involved in high school or collegiate sports. 40 years later, that number was 10 million. There are 3 million. There were huge, huge increases. I forget all the numbers now. I wrote them in the book. But it was an incredible the, the number of ways that it has changed the country. And it's something that I can tell you made him very proud. And the number of honors he received as a result were substantial. He went on to uh, do other things that were important for women. And where, where Title IX, let me just concentrate on Title IX a bit, because people associate Title IX with women's sports. And that was clearly one of the effects of Title IX, which just celebrated its 50th anniversary this last year. Title IX was really not about sports. It was really about treating men and women the same in terms of admissions, that there were very few women in law schools. There were very few women in medical schools. And there were a number of schools that accepted federal money and didn't allow women in at all. And Birch's wife, Marvella, had always desired to go to the University of Virginia as she grew up. She had been a very substantial person in her own right. She'd been president, governor of Girls State, president of Girls Nation, came to Washington when she was in college or, and was able to meet President Truman as president of Girls Nation. And she wanted to go to the University of Virginia and had one of those letters saying women need not apply because they were men only. And she used to always say to Birch, how can you men let these universities take federal money and yet treat women the way they do? So he saw that as a simply a matter of equity and inserted this language into the Educational Opportunity Act that got very little attention at the time. But women's groups picked up on it right away and started using it for the basis of lawsuits. And it spread out throughout the country and created a groundswell that made Title IX much more well-known than it was at the time. And when President Nixon signed the 1972 Educational Opportunity Act, he made no mention of Title IX. But it, again, it was, it was passed really more broadly about women's acceptance into colleges and universities throughout the country and into medical schools and law schools and so on. Birch also appointed when Carter was president, the first woman to become a district attorney in the country's history, he appointed the first woman to be a, a chief counsel of the Senate subcommittee. And in 1978, a woman sued General Electric 
in a, in a case that went all the way to the Supreme Court called General Electric versus Gerber or Gerber versus GE, in which she was denied health benefits um, for uh, when she became pregnant. She took that case all the way to the Supreme Court and the court ruled that General Electric was within its rights not to give her benefits because health benefits were designed for involuntary illness that pregnancy is voluntary. Birch then wrote the Pregnancy Discrimination Act of 1978, which is the law of the land to this day, which says that is in effect that because only women can be pregnant to deny them benefits is discriminatory under the Civil Rights Act. And one of the female activists that was in our office during that period to help draft that legislation, now known as RBG, was Ruth Bader Ginsburg. So that legacy is something. Uh, you know, I, I'll never forget that right after the senator died in 2019, uh, four days after he died, the Washington Post had a column by the columnist Charles Lane that you can imagine my surprise when I opened the newspaper and the headline says, we're living in Birch Buys world. We just don't know it. And it very much is consistent with the theme of why I did the book. And what he wrote in, in, this, in this column, I'll quote just a bit of it. He says, briefly, here are two of his insights into a remarkable Senate career. In short, Bai wrote the crucial ground rules that contemporary Americans take for granted. You could almost call him a founder of the modern United States. The United States has a history of accumulating problems before dealing with them. The New Deal, the Great Society, and perhaps whatever might be coming after the Trump years. Much will depend on whether the Congress retains any legislative vitality and whether anyone of by stripe is around to make use of it. So we had this slew of uh, accomplishments in the area of women's rights, which he has been honored for over the years um, and of which he was very proud. But his record was so much more broad than that and it's, I, I'd like to just to touch on a, a few of the points, if I may. And one of them, a, a particular story that I enjoy, is, again, symptomatic of what the Senate was like in the 70s and 80s compared to what the Senate is like today. In 1980, early in 1980, a bunch of Purdue University professors, Birch had graduated from Purdue, and as you know, Birch in, Purdue was in Indiana, uh, came to our office to, to complain that they had been involved with some inventions at Purdue that had federal grants, but the, because of that, the rules for federal patent law was that if the federal government had money in a patent, in, into a, an invention or a development copyright, the federal government reserved for itself the right to bring it to market. And the numbers are, are daunting. There were 28,000 patents owned at that point by the U.S. government, and only 5% of them had been brought into market. So a lot of them were just going nowhere. And the analogy I, I used in the book when I told about this was that, you know, if you remember the movie Raiders of the Lost Ark, where they're, they're, they're taking the last scene as the Ark of the Covenant is being taken into this huge warehouse and put on a shelf where it would sit. And that's what was happening to American innovation. And so Birch uh, partnered up with Bob Dole and wrote what became known as the By Dole Act. Senator Russell Long of Louisiana, Huey Long's son, who was the chairman of the Senate Finance Committee, was one of the true powers in the Senate in that era and described that legislation as the worst piece of legislation ever written. Um, President Carter was opposed to it. Um, Hyman Rickover, the former admiral who was, Carter was very close to, was opposed to it. And there are a lot of reasons for different, different people wanting to protect the government's control of these patents, but it didn't, didn't uh, ignore, it ignored the fact that they just weren't being brought to market. And so by Dole, passed the Senate, passed the House, but only because of an act, it, it, 
an activity in the Senate, which really probably wouldn't happen today, which was we lost our election in 1980. The bill at that point had not passed. And one day in that, there is a, a lame duck session called by President Carter because a budget hadn't been passed for 1980. And in those two months between the, the election and when the terms expire, Senator Bayh gets a phone call from Senator Long, who says, Birch, I'm really sorry you lost your election. We're going to miss you here. I've enjoyed working with you. That patent bill of yours and Bob Dole's, it's yours. He gave it to him as a parting gift. It then became law. President Carter did sign it into law. And it has meant more than $2 trillion of generated revenue since. More than 3,000 companies created under Buy Dole. The number of, of life-saving in devices, environmental devices, in vitro devices, huge number of companies. One of the companies that was created under the new rules that wouldn't have been brought to market under the old rules is Google. So it has had a huge impact on our lives. And uh, second to Title IX, by Dole is the, it was the piece of legislation that he earned an enormous number of uh, audits for and honors over the years leading up to his death. But I'd be remiss if I failed to mention uh, some of the other part of his legacy. In fact, people in Washington and our Washington area should appreciate the fact that he provided the first funding for the DC, DC subway system. Mm -hmm. He had become chairman of the Senate Appropriations Subcommittee and sub, also chairman of the DC Appropriations Subcommittee and was looking at uh, various pieces of legislation that had been written to authorize another bridge across the Potomac when he became chairman. And he asked the chief counsel, he said, why isn't there a subway here? He said, I've been in every, so many of the major cities of the world, and there are subways in all of them, but not in D.C. So he took that money that had been reserved for an extra bridge, and he put it into the first study to come up with a budget and a plan to build what became D.C. Metro. And that was always something he was very proud of. So he had an impact on a piece of legislation that got him not a single vote in Indiana. But it was the right thing to do. And other parts of that Senate legacy, again, uh, the Comprehensive Disaster Relief Act of 1967, which he authored, the creation of the National Alcohol Fuels Commission, which he both authored and served as its first chairman. His service as both a member and a chairman of the Senate Intelligence Committee and leading to his work on creating FISA, the Juvenile Justice and Delinquency Prevention Act, the Privacy Protection Act, as well as, the, as I said, the funding of the DC subway. The Juvenile Justice Act, for instance, uh, he, he, when he chaired the Subcommittee on Juvenile Delinquency, he became painfully aware of the way juvenile delinquents and runaways were being treated by our legal system like law-violating adults. There was no different system for treating juvenile delinquency or young people running away from home. He, I, I'll, I'll never forget one hearing that he was at in which a young girl had, there was testimony about a young girl who had run away repeatedly because she was being raped by her second stepfather. And every time she was caught, she was returned to home. So it was logical that she would run away again. There was no place for her to go. And the Runaway Youth Act created a system of, of halfway houses for runaways. So, you know, when I, I, I give this variety of legislation, of things he did, uh, that make us very proud. And like I said, he was, he was uh, very good at what he did. He loved legislating. When he first ran for office, uh, a number of people in Indiana wanted him to run instead for governor. But he said he, he felt he was a legislative animal. He didn't want to be governor of Indiana, even though he thought he had a shot at being governor if he wanted to. And funnily and funny enough is his son, Evan, also became a U.S. senator after he became governor of Indiana. So Evan served two terms as governor and two terms as the senator. And the legacy uh, is a broad one. In fact, if I can talk about the legacy, the Birch by legacy for a bit, uh, 
it is not just legislative. I mean, he has had staff people that have had a ripple effect on this country. Um, a number of people that have held important government jobs. Uh, former Chief of Staff Jay Berman became the head of the American Recording Arts Association. And our current Chief of Staff for President Biden is a guy by the name of Ron Klain, who was my intern when he was 17 years old in 1980, has been a lifelong friend since, and is, is serving President Biden very proudly since. Ron's from Indianapolis and got his start in the buy office. So, you know, this is, there have been a lot of us who are very proud of the associations we've had, of the people that came out of that office. And I feel like, you know, like I was enormously lucky. I, one of the things when I would be taking a bus from GW to the buy office while in college, I often would ride with other people like me who were working for other senators. And I remember them, you know, how many times they would tell me they hadn't even met their Senate employer, or that they almost never saw him or never talked to him. And that was simply never the case in our office. For instance, when Birch would go to vote in the Senate, he would always walk through the office and stop and chat with people all along the way until he headed out to the Senate subway. It was one of those things that just made you feel like you were part of something. And, you know, where I say I'm lucky, I was lucky to not only work for someone who I think was a great senator, but someone who was a great guy. He became a very important friend of mine. And writing the book about him is was both a, a labor of love on my part, but also paid back for him. And I, I am pleased to say that he was able to read the first version of the book that I wrote, first draft, which is considerably longer, longer than the, fi the final version. Um, but he uh, grew ill before the book finally came out. And ironically, the, the memorial service that was held at the Indianapolis State, State House in Indianapolis on May 1st, 2019 was ironically the formal publication date for my book. So, you know, it was like I said, it was a 52 year relationship in my life, one of which I was, I felt very, very fortunate. Uh, there are so many, there are so many memories. There were so many things on a personal note that were important. Uh, when my first son was four years old, he had to have open heart surgery for a, a hole in his heart. And the only person that showed up at the hospital outside of family was Birch Bai. Uh, similarly, I had a sister-in-law, I have a sister-in-law who was a federal judge in uh, New York, Connecticut. And when she was up for confirmation, he came and sat with her at the head table on the Judiciary Committee and was welcomed by all of his, by those who were there who had been his former colleagues. And it just made her feel so great. I just, again, a, a poignant note, when, when he died, uh, she sent me a, an email and said, oh, I saw that Birch died today. And I'll never forget how you had him come to my hearing. And I said to him, no, I didn't ask him to come to your hearing. He asked me if it was okay to come to your hearing. So it was that kind of generosity. He was a terrific human being. He was a terrific legislator. He's had his impact on this country. I like to think that the book was a was worth doing. You know, when I entered into this, I felt I knew the stories. I felt I had the material. I certainly had access to the, a number of people that would contribute great, great parts of this book. I just didn't know if I had the, the talent and ability to do it. And, you know, so I guess other people will have to judge whether or not I did. But nonetheless, it, it is uh, something I'm proud of. Uh, I'm glad we did it. I think his is a story that is worth telling. And I've probably gone on long enough and, and happy to answer any questions you might have out here. Thanks, Bob. That was Fabulous. Um, Thank you. You're prejudiced. <laughs> <laughs> lots of great information. And um, I also wanted to mention that one of our own in Chevy Chase wrote the obit for Birch Bay, um, Larry Barnett, who lives at the Willard, um, is a, a writer. And um, funny enough, in the small world category, he wrote the obit for Birch. Yes, he did. So, 
So for those of you who um, might have some questions, you can either unmute yourself. Actually, Jennifer, I don't know where you went. Um, you might want to um, unmute yourself to ask a question, or I'm not sure if Jennifer's uh, doing the dials. Uh, yeah, anyone can unmute themselves if they'd like to ask a question, if they're welcome to. Okay, Susan? I was wondering why Birch by never ran again for public office. Why, after he lost, you mean? Yeah. Well, he kind of felt it was Evan's turn. It was clear, uh, first of all, he had, when, he, when we lost in 1980, he had huge debt. And that campaign debt we had became personal. He had also foolishly invested in real estate in Washington before the economy went south in 1980. And all of a sudden he had a bunch of uh, houses that he couldn't find renters for. So he had some, some severe financial difficulties and he needed to make money. So he had the opportunity to practice law. In fact, one of the things he said election night in 1980, he stood there while a bunch of us were you know, feeling pretty lousy about seeing that our, our jobs go down the tubes and knowing that he was no longer going to be a senator. And he said to the crowd, he said, look, I can't be sad. You gave me the opportunity to do exactly what I wanted to do for the last 18 years. And now you give me the opportunity to practice law, which he, of course, did. And he, uh, you know, so he, he began to practice law, got himself, got remarried. His wife, Marvella, had died in 1979 of breast cancer. And then Birch ended up remarrying in the end of 1981 and becoming a father again in 1982. At that point, Evan clearly had uh, gone back to Indiana, had an interest in running for Secretary of State, and Birch kind of felt it was his turn. So Birch was not only uh, had the need to, to pay off he, these huge debts and make money, but he had started a new family and his son, Evan, um, he had a career ahead of him. Yeah, for those who may not remember, you know, he had actually tried to run for president on two occasions. He began to run in 1971 before the Nixon reelection in 1972. I've often thought we were probably fortunate he didn't win that nomination because I think Nixon was not gonna lose that reelection. Um, and of course, he buried Senator McGovern. But in 1971, Birch looked around and felt that the he was as good as anyone in the field and that Nixon needed to be defeated. So essentially, he decided to run against him. And we had a good thing going. I mean, a lot of things were working well, falling into place when Marvella was diagnosed as having breast cancer. And he dropped out of the race in October of 71. Because there's just no way you can you can you can proceed with something like running for president when your wife has a life threatening disease, and she became a, sort of really the country's first public mastectomy victim, um, and really hated the fact that it became so public, and she could not suffer in private, um, and I mean she was before Betty Ford and all that, but it when it came back in 1978. Uh, she was very adamant that those of us who knew about the recurrence of the cancer were sworn to secrecy, and it did not become public until until she really started getting uh, deathly ill, and she died in April of 1979. So in 1976, her health had returned, and she was in good shape, and she was working for the American Cancer Society, and Birch decided to try again. After our 1974 re-election, a lot of people were calling on him during that 70, 1975 period. Gerald Ford would be uh, the incumbent. Nobody felt that he was a sure thing for re-election. So a lot of Democrats, if you look at the record, were running. There was uh, Jimmy Carter was one of them, certainly, as well as Mor Congressman Morris Udall, Senators Henry Jackson, um, Fred Harris, uh, Birch Bay, a lot of people. And Birch went for it and lost in the early primaries and got out. So essentially, he did have aspirations to run for president on those two occasions. Um, I honestly don't think he ever thought about it again after that period. But that's a long answer to your question about why did he not run again? I'm sorry. Thank you. 
<laughs> that was great. No, thanks for asking, Susan. Um, I have another question, um, and uh, from uh, Ellen McGovern, who says, "Bob, in the Title IX community, we thank you for writing this book. It was a different time. I remember him too. He was so authentic, as you describe. But her question is." What was his unfinished agenda, do you think? And did his son, Evan, take on some of those issues along with his own agenda? Do you know? Good question. Good question, Ellen, and hello. Um, well, he was really committed to the Equal Rights Amendment. And in 1979, uh, sponsored legislation to extend the time period. What happens when you put, pass a constitutional amendment is there is, uh, legislation that goes along with, with it that spells out the process. And, and typically the last several amendments that, been, that had passed the Congress had a seven year limit, mm -hmm. as did the Equal Rights Amendment. And in 1979, with three states yet to ratify and Phyllis Schlafly and her crew really creating a, a groundswell of conservatism to try to defeat the amendment, he was really committed to trying to extend that time period and pass legislation to extend it. So that time period was still going on after we lost. And I would, have say, I would say now that that would have been one of his chief agenda items. He loved the fact that he was a member of the Senate Appropriations Committee, because as he always said, he, he, you know, it, when he was a legislator in Indiana, he could pass legislation to authorize different things that he, when he then became the Senate, he could move those to, to also get federal authorization. And then when he got on the Senate Appropriations Committee, he could help get them funded. So he liked that whole process from beginning to end and getting those things accomplished. I'm not really certain, or at least I don't remember what he may have had further on an agenda at the time. I would say Evan's agenda was very different. Evan And Evan was a very different politician than his father. Uh, more, can, I would say Evan was in many respects more his mother's son than his father's and some of that, and I don't mean that in an insulting way at all. It just said Evan was more conservative, more cautious than Birch. I will never forget a conversation he and I had on an airplane once. After, uh, you may remember in the Nixon presidency, there were two nominations for the Supreme Court, Hainsworth and Carswell, who were both rejected by the Senate. Birch led the opposition on both of those. It was the only time that's ever happened before or since. Two successive nominations defeated. And that was really where the groundswell for him to run for president began because of those. But I remember him saying to me on a plane, you know, when you get in this business, you want everyone to like you. He said it took him an awful long time to realize if he was going to stand for anything, he was going to make enemies. And that his job wasn't just to be in office in order to stay in office. His job was to make a difference, which is why the title is Birch by Making a Difference. He loved that because he said, that's why I'm here. I'm here to make a difference. And he felt he did. And when we talked about the record in the interviews, it was a recurring theme that came up over and over. I wanted to make a difference. And I think I did. And I think Evan was his own man, very different. You know, having served as governor for eight years, I'm sure, it was a whole different experience for him than Birch had for serving in the legislature. Plus, it was a whole different time. Uh, being, a, being a senator in the 90s uh, was much different than being a senator in the 60s, 70s, and then finishing in 1981. So I hope that answers your question, Ellen. Um, thank you, Bob. We have another question from Peter. Um, uh, okay, so uh, Peter asked, um, can you talk a bit about Indiana politics today and what in your <laughs> view ultimately changed the state from one that elected and reelected a liberal Democrat uh, as a senator to one that is now pretty reliably Republican. And we do have a few other questions behind Okay, that. I'll, I'll be brief, but I, on this way, I'll try to watch my language too, describing the way Indiana is now. Um, Indiana is a conservative state. Indiana has been a statewide Republican state for much of its 20th century. 
I mean, it had only voted for a Democratic presidential candidate four times in the 20th century. Um, but the era of, of the 60s, when Birch Bayh ran, when Vance Harkey was also a senator from Indiana, um, both of them were liberal Democrats. At the time, we had 11 members of Congress, nine of whom were Democrats. Um, it was a very different time. It was a very personal time of politics. TV had not become the huge presence in politics that it became in the 70s and certainly in the 80s. Um, politics got nationalized, I think, in a lot of respects. Birch Bayh could survive on his personality, on his, on his likability. And increasingly, as his career moved on and he became more associated with national politics and national democratic politics, he became le lots of less safe. And, you know, Vance Harkey lost in 1976, Birch lost in, 19, in, in 1980. And right now, out of, I think there's nine congressmen in Indiana right now, and there's only one Democrat, two Democrats. So it's seven to two Democrats. It has changed a lot. Ronald Reagan won the state overwhelmingly in 1980, the year we lost. In 2016, Evan went back to try to help the Clintons and to run again for the Senate in 2016. And Donald Trump won the state bigger than Reagan had in 1980. So the state's gotten far more conservative. And I, I'm not sure that I could give a long uh, you know, explanation of why that has happened, but it clearly has happened. Uh, what people kept saying to me with Pete Buttigieg, Pete should stay in Indiana, run for senator and governor. And I say, no, he shouldn't. He can't win. It's not winnable right now. Will it change? Possibly, but not in the near term. Interesting. Uh, another question we have is from Susan, is what were Senator Bayh's thoughts about being there, support for Obama, Obama to be president and about su support for Trump to be president. Well, That'd be nice. I will try. In, in <laughs> 2008, that was the last time Birch actually campaigned. He went out to Indiana and campaigned with Obama and for Obama. Obama actually won Indiana in 2008, which was a shock to many of us. I mean, I, I had people telling me polling in 2008 that Obama was heading Indiana, and I told them they didn't know what they're talking about. I was wrong. They were right. Um, he he liked Obama. He liked Bill Clinton. Um, he Joe Biden. We have a lot of history with Joe Biden, uh, not just with the Ron Klain relationship, but you know, Birch uh, had a lot of a lot of examples with Joe Biden. So he liked Joe Biden a lot. He was not a Donald Trump fan, as you might imagine. He would talk about it. We talked about it a lot after the 2016 election. Um, he was not happy with, with the nature of the Trump camp presidency, a lot of what he felt was demagoguery. But, you know, he was also in a different era. He had gotten a lot older. He was much less engaged than he was. He, he, was, he did re, re, remain mentally sharp right up to the end as his body started to fail him. Um, and I can just say in general, he wasn't happy with the Trump presidency. Uh, he would have been happy to know that Joe Biden got elected president. He would have been thrilled by that because he liked Joe Biden enormously. I'll never forget uh, his calling Joe Biden after the, Biden's wife was killed in the accident when Biden had first gotten elected to the Senate at age 29. Um, so he would have been very pleased with Joe Biden, but he, he was not a Trump fan. Um, thank you. Uh, let's see, we have a couple questions here. We have a question about what happened on January 6th, but um, Birch Bayh had already passed away at that point. So that would just be your opinion, Mr. Blameyer. So I think we'll leave that one alone. All right. Um, uh, let's see. I am going to put up a slide in a few minutes uh, for those of you who would um, be interested in buying the book and how you go about that. Um, buy thousands of books. Buy, buy as many copies as you want. Yes, uh, <laughs> please do. Um, uh, so we have Belle Davis. Um, she wrote a book, autobiography entitled Marvella, published in 1979. Now, Mar Belle Davis didn't write it. Marvella wrote an autobiography about, Mar about herself called Marvella. Uh, 
I have it over here. Actually, it's, no, it's now packed up with my stuff because I'm moving. But yes, in fact, it was the first time I've ever had my name mentioned in a book that Marvella mentioned my name in the book because I took her to the doctor, to the doctor, to the hospital when she was diagnosed as having breast cancer and was with her the day the doctor came and said she needed to have a mastectomy. Um, so yes, her, bio, her, her autobiography is a great read. I actually read it again as I was preparing for the book and took a number of notes out of it that were used in the book. Great. She was quite a person. And many yeah, people, you know, that, people that were involved in his first campaign said to me they felt had it been a different era, she very likely could have been the senator instead of him. She was very ambitious, very, very professional, very articulate. And a great speaker in her own right as yes. well. Um, and you're a great speaker also. Um, <laughs> thank you for joining us. Um, we appreciate your taking the time to be with Chevy Chase at home today and share your experience and knowledge and your book. Um, do we have any final questions before I throw up a slide on how to purchase the book? Uh, or uh, Jennifer, do you need to say any parting words about Chevy Chase at home while I figure out how to uh, share my screen again? Other than, sure. oh, go ahead. I wanna just um, open it up to anyone who wants to unmute has a question. Let me just add a, a note of thanks again. I appreciate the opportunity. I, I love talking about the book and talking about him. As I said, a huge presence in my life and a legacy that I like to share and hope gets passed on appropriately. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Bob and Kathleen. And thank you to everyone for joining us. I know Kathleen has a slide um, she's going to put on. So please don't log off just yet. But I just want to thank you for joining us today. Um, I hope that you will, I invite you to look at our Chevy Chase at Home website for more information on our upcoming programming. And uh, hope that you consider joining your local village as either a member or volunteer. Yes. Um, wait a minute. So um, I agree, any of you who are just visiting from another village or whatever, please do consider joining Chevy Chase at home uh, if you're in that area. Uh, and if you have any questions, you can certainly email us after this presentation. So here is, uh, for those interested in purchasing a personally inscribed copy of the hardcover book, Birch Buy, I happen to have mine right here. How about that? <laughs> Um, just send a check to Robert Blameyer, who is moving to Chevy Chase next week. That's his address. You can do it via Zelle or Venmo if you wish. Um, for all of our viewers out there, I'd also like to um, take a moment and ask for your prayers. Um, Bob's mother, who is 95, had a fall yesterday and she is now in the hospital. She's quite the woman at 95 years old, but it is really difficult to experience that setback. Um, Thank you, Kathleen. Also, yeah, so we're all rooting for her. If you think about it, say a little quick prayer that- uh, You know, my, my mother is one month older than Birch Bay, And uh, uh, I, was, I always could do, know exactly how old he was because I always knew how old my mother was. Yeah. So she's quite the pistol and um, I hope she gets it through her surgery and everything very well. Thank you. Um, any other questions? I think that covers it. If you do have a question um, or need more information, please feel free to mail, email Chevy Chase at home or myself, Kathleen McGinnis. We'd be delighted to hear from you. Thanks for everything, signing off. Hope you all have a great rest of your day. And again, thank you for joining Chevy Chase at home. Bye.